Inshallah ta'ala, we keep the khutbah uh, short and simple, this being the youth, the youth uh, khutbah. Um, just a few reminders from the kitab of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and the words of his messenger Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, he tells us in the Quran, in an ayah, which is called Ayatul Imtihan, the verse of examination. Imtihan is the same word that's used when you take an exam or a test in school, except that we have to test ourselves. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says in this ayah, this is Surah Ali Imran, ayah number 31. To Hibbun Allah, Fatabi Uni, you Hibbum Allah, Wayal Filak Mudurubakum, Wallahu, Wallahu Hafur Rahim. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, He says, Pull to the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, and by extension to all of us, if you really love Allah, then you have to follow me. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is telling the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam to tell the people that if you claim to love Allah, because there's a group of people who came to the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, and they said, نَحْنُ نُحِبُّ اللَّهِ إِنَّا نُحِبُّ اللَّهِ Verily, we love Allah. We love Allah. And the Prophet ﷺ presented himself as the messenger of God, and they rejected him. And they said, no, we don't need that. You know, we, we, we're we good with God. We don't need to believe in your risala. This is the sabab al nuzul This is the occasion of this ayah's revelation. That if you really love Allah, فَاتِّبِعُونِ You have to have ittiba' You have to have uh, adherence to the Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam. Yuhbib kum Allah, and then this verb yuhbib in English, this is called a justive mood. Uh, essentially, this is a purpose clause. So, if you love Allah, follow me, so that Allah will love you. You see, so the 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 uh, special love, special mahabba of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And of course, there's a level of love that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has for all of his creation. You know, so we shouldn't listen to rhetoric and anti-Muslim propaganda that characterizes our theology as being loveless. Muslims don't have love in their religion. You know, these people put up videos on YouTube. You know, show me one verse in the Quran where it says, God loves anyone in the Quran. rahim These all are akin to love. So there is a general love that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has for all of his creation. And the reason we know that, according to Imam al-Ghazali, is because Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala created the universe. And nothing can compel him to create anything. Nothing compels him. He is the compeller. Allah is al-Jabbar. He's never majboor. So the fact that he made a conscious choice out of his absolute volition to create anything means that he wants a relationship. And that's an indication that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is a personal deity that he's loving. But here we're talking about the special love of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. The special love of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala comes with ittiba' of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. So that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will love you and forgive you your sins. And Allah is wafuru rahim. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is constantly forgiving and he's intimately loving. So this is, this is our barometer, as it were, the measuring stick. It is not based on the amount of money in our bank account or how much, you know, how many square footage our homes are. It's not based on the size of our salaries. It's not based on any of these. How many children do you have? How tall are you? How white is your skin? None of these types of things. At the end of the day, the only thing that's going to matter is our ittiba, is our uh, adherence to the Prophet sallallahu Right? So this is what we have to be conscious of in our daily lives. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in the Quran, He has certain ayat that are ayat of promise, of wa'ad, and ayat of threat, wa'id. And these two words are related etymologically. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala makes a promise. And we read these promises and we should be filled with hope. That's the purpose of a promise. We should have raja. Raja means to have hope with action, not just blind hope. Right? A lot like the person who you know, doesn't want to work, but wants to be a millionaire. If it happens, it happens. You have to work for it, right? Someone who wants to go to Jannah. I want to be in the highest levels of Jannah. Oh, it's time to pray. Uh, you know, whatever. Allah is forgiving. He's merciful. That's a true statement. But that's not real raja. Raja is to work for something and then have hope in Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. 
So these are the purpose, this is one of the purpose of these ayat of, of wa'ad, these verses of promise. But then Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala also has promises of threat, or sorry, of, uh, verses of threat, of wa'id. And the threat of Allah is something that we should take very seriously. When a human being threatens us, we take it very, very seriously. If someone calls your home in the middle of the night and threatens you, you're going to call the police, you're going to move out of your house, you're going to take precautions. Well, what about when Rabbul Alameen, when the Lord of everything, when the creator of everything threatens us? So we should be cognizant of these. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says in Surah Al-Tawbah, ayah number 24, he says in meaning that if any of these ephemeral things, all, any of these dunyawi types of things, and he mentions, you know, houses and spouses and children and money and, you know, uh, any type, any possessions that we have, whatever they are. If any of these types of things, your career, whatever it may be, if any of these things are dearer to you or more beloved to you, أَحَبَّ إِلَيْكُمْ مِنَ اللَّهِ وَرَسُولِهِ وَجِهَادٍ فِي سَبِيلِهِ If any of these things are more dear to you than Allah, His Messenger, and striving in His cause, فَتَرَبَّسُوا Then just wait. حَتَّى يَأْتِيَ اللَّهُ بِأَمْرِهِ Then just wait and see what happens to you. Wait till the, the Amr of Allah comes. This is a threat. We don't want to wait. The purpose of this ayah is to shock our nafs out of its complacency, right? Oftentimes we get comfortable in our lives. And one of the reasons why we read the Quran is to fill us with hope and also fear of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Hope of His mercy, but also fear of His wrath. And this is a healthy place to be spiritually. Not so much hope that we start acting irresponsibly. There are some people in the world who believe that they have an unconditional covenant with God, irrespective of obedience. Why? Because I'm born of a certain race. There are certain people who believe this. I'm born of a certain race, I'm chosen by God. It's not even based on obedience. I have the upper hand. There are other people in the world who believe that if you believe one time and have no action whatsoever, it's okay, you're totally okay. It has no effect on your iman. You're going to go straight into Jannah. We're, this, these are extreme positions. We have to be careful not, not to have so much hope in Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala that we start become irresponsible in our actions. We leave the prayer. We don't guard our eyesight. We're not watching what we're doing. We're not watching what we're eating and drinking. We're loose with our tongues to our parents. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, he says in a hadith, he says, Al-Kaba'ir, the greatest of sins, and he names them, Al-Ishraqu Billah, is to in partner with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. To say Allah has some sort of partner. There's a, there's a different person of God. Something like that. Right? Or someone has the attributes of God. This person who's other than God has attributes of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. This is the biggest sin. It's spiritual treason. And then he says, Disrespect of parents. Disrespect of parents. And we know the hadith, Jibreel alayhi salam. When the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wasallam, this is a foundational hadith in our tradition. When the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wasallam was asked by Jibreel alayhi salam, this is Sahih Muslim and Bukhari. He said, "Akhbirni an al-sa'ah." Tell me about the hour. And the Prophet said, "Man masulu anha bi a'la min al-sa'ibi." The one being questioned knows no more than the questioner, because the the ilm of the sa'ah is only known to Allah subhanahu wa taala. Nobody knows it. No messenger, no angel. Only Allah subhanahu wa taala. So Jibreel alayhi salam says to him, then tell me about its signs, what are some portents of it. And one of the first things the Prophet sallallahu mentions is that a woman will give birth to her master or mistress. What does that mean? The ulama say this means that children will immediately begin disrespecting their parents. This is a major sin in the eyes, as it were, of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Right? So if hope in Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, proper hope, hope with action, we also have fear of Allah. Khawf. Be between khawf and raja. Khawf and raja. Fear and hope. Where are the two sandals of fear and hope? The Prophet said. But not so much fear that we begin to despair of Allah's mercy. We begin to despair. I talked to a man who admitted to me that he's killed a lot of people. He was under orders. He told me, I've killed a lot of people. He said, I've killed a lot of children. I was under orders. This is what he said. I said, why did you do that? He said, I don't know. I don't know. You know, it's a sign of the end of time. Al-Qatulu, right? La, la ya'lamu. 
Lima Katala, the, the one the one killing doesn't know why he's killing. Right? And he said to me, Do you think God will forgive me? And he was non-Muslim. So I quoted an ayah of the Quran to him. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, Oh, say, oh my servants who have completely debased themselves. Asrafu ala anfusihim. Completely debased their own souls. La ta'natu mi rahmatillah. Never ever be in despair of the mercy of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. It is haram, it is wrong, it is incorrect to ever be in a state of despair of the mercy of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, if we make tawbah, Allah is a tawbah. How many names of Allah, how many of his blessed names deal with this idea of Allah forgiving us? He is a tawbah. He is al ghafir He is al ghaffar He is al ghafur He is al afu The one who erases the sin. There's no trace of it left. al afu this is Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. This is our Lord. Allah will never grow tired of forgiving us unless we grow tired of asking for tawbah. And of course, he never grows tired. This is a matter of speaking. As long, in, in other words, as long as we keep making tawbah, Allah will keep forgiving us. But when we make tawbah, it's very important that our tawbah is correct. Right? As one of my teachers said, sometimes our tawbah requires a tawbah. But it's not really a tawbah. A tawbah has requisites. One must have nadama. One must have remorse for the sin and a firm azima, a firm resolve that this person will never return to this sin again. Even if he does return at the time of tawbah, he has a, he has full resolve that he won't return to the sin. Right? This is a true tawbah. And again, our uh, role model is the Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam. You have the Messenger of God, a beautiful pattern of conduct. Listen to what Allah says in the next part of the ayah. For those who have hope, those who have raja, the Messenger of God is a beautiful pattern of conduct. For those who have hope, raja, in Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, and in the final day, and remember Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala with much remembrance. So, it's important for our young people to have role models, right? This we should study the Meccan period of the Prophet's life. When the Prophet ﷺ was living in Mecca, a lot of young people became Muslim. There's a very young companion of the Prophet ﷺ, Mus'ab ibn Umar radiallahu ta'ala anhu, who was very, very young at the time, very wealthy, became Muslim. And Mus'ab was known for wearing new clothes every day, sometimes twice a day you'd have a new thobar. Very wealthy. You know, very beautiful looking young man. He was like a, a, a superstar in Mecca. And he became Muslim, and his parents cut him off financially. And he was in dire straits. And the Prophet ﷺ sent him to Al Habasha, Abyssinia, to live for a while. Many years later, the Prophet ﷺ was sitting in the masjid in Mecca, in the Haram. And Mus'ab ibn Umar comes back to Mecca. He's wearing rags with patches sewn into him. And into them. His skin is just tattered, his hair is disheveled, no shoes on his feet. And the Prophet ﷺ began to cry. Not because he felt sorry for him. And the, and the, 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 moral, the, the moral of this story is not to go walk around with, with rags on. You've missed the point, if that's what you think. The Prophet ﷺ began to cry because he saw this, this, this superstar amongst the kuffar just reduced to this humble slave of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. He was crying because he saw the power of the revelation, the power of Iman. Right? This is why we should never despair of Allah's mercy. And we should treat our neighbors and friends uh, as if they're potential Muslims. They're human beings. The fact that people are human beings means that they, they deserve respect. لَقَدْ كَرَّمْنَا بَنِي آدَمَ Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says in the Qur'an that we have ennobled the sons and daughters of Adam. So it's important for us to have good attitude with people. Right? Even if people are fed false information, which is happening all the time. Look at the Prophet in Mecca. There was a propaganda campaign out against him. The leaders of the Quraysh met in the Dar of Nidwa, their city council. Right? And they decided that they were going to spread propaganda about him. And they were mulling this over. What should we call him? They said, let's call him a liar. And then they said, no, we can't call him that because we called him a Sadiqul Amin. Now they're gonna, it's going to make us look bad if we call him a liar. 
He said, let's call him a sha'ir. He's a poet, right? He said, well, that's not going to work either because he's not known for composing poetry. It's not going to work. So then Al-Walid ibn Mughayra, he said, let's call him a sahir, a sorcerer. He's a sorcerer because he can divide families. And so that's a good one. So the Quraysh would send out these riders to intercept people coming into Mecca. Right? Welcome to Mecca. Enjoy the festivities. But stay away from this man Muhammad, sallallahu alayhi wa He's a sahir. He's going to bewitch you. Right? So people were told propaganda about him. Even before meeting him. Even before hearing him one time. So a lot of people in our neighborhoods are like this. In our lives are like this. They've never actually heard from the Prophet Well, How can they hear from him? They hear from him from us. Because we are ambassadors of the Prophet And when people, whether you like it or not, our behavior, right? Our behavior, whether it's good or bad, informs others of Islam. This guy's a Muslim. Look what he's doing. Whether you like that or not, that's what's going to happen. Right? So, a lot of people have negative perceptions of us, not only because of negative media that they're hearing, but because of their bad experiences with Muslims. Because we haven't actualized that beautiful khulq of the Prophet Right? So the Prophet is da'iyan illallah. He is the caller to Allah par excellence. How did he call people to Allah? What was he doing in Mecca? He went about his business. He was being a good practicing Muslim. People wanted to hear from him. He would speak with them. So Tufail ibn Amr al-Dawsi came into Mecca. He heard all this propaganda about the Prophet ﷺ. He saw the Prophet ﷺ at the Kaaba reciting Quran. He said, I was so afraid I bought into the propaganda. I put cotton in my ears and made my tawaf because I didn't want to hear him because he would bewitch me. So Tufayl ibn Amr, he said, he passed by the Prophet ﷺ. He said, Allah willed that something of his qira'ah entered into my head. Something of his qira'ah. And I said, SubhanAllah, that was beautiful. So I took some cotton out. And I went around again. I passed him again. And I heard more. And I said, SubhanAllah, this is incredible. So I took all of the cotton out. And I just stood there and was listening to his qira'ah. And then he said to himself, he relates the hadith. He said, I thought to myself, I'm a grown man. I'm a grown man. Why should I listen to propaganda? I'm going to sit with him. I'll make up my own mind. So he sat with him. He said, who are you? What is this that you're reciting? He said, this is the Quran and the Messenger of God. And he immediately became Muslim. Immediately. This is the way of the Prophet ﷺ. Right? Somebody comes, he gives them guidance. And Tufayl ibn Amr, he went back to his people, the Bani Daus, and he started making da'wah, right? And the Prophet sallallahu is da'iyan illallah, who siraj al-munira, but nobody else really is. And he was a young Muslim, so he's trying to make da'wah, and it wasn't working very well. So he came back to the Prophet sallallahu and he said, Ya Rasulullah, I'm calling these people to Islam, but they're laughing at me, they're rejecting me. Can you curse them? <laughs> curse them. Yeah? And the Prophet said, no, we're not going to curse anybody. And the Prophet said, he said, I was sent as a gifted mercy. mercy gifted mercy. And he said, let's go, fight and, let's go fight against them and force them to convert. And he said, no, we're not going to do that either. He said, so go back to your people, O Tufayl, and shepherd to them. And have rifq, have gentleness with them. So, okay, so he goes back. He implements the, uh, the training tarbiyah of the Prophet ﷺ, and he shepherds to them, he takes care of them, he's a pastor to them, right? He shows gentleness towards them, and there's convert after convert after convert. Eventually, a man named Abu Huraira becomes Muslim from Bani Daus, who becomes a fountain of prophetic knowledge. This is the way of the Prophet ﷺ. There was a man in Mecca named Arkham who became Muslim, and the Muslims would go to his house, he had a very large house, he would go and make vicar and pray there and listen to the lectures of the Prophet So one of the mushrikeen, he would sit on the way to Darul al -Arqam, and he would uh, bring these singing and dancing girls and he'd uh, distract Muslims who were going to see the Prophet 
with these singing and dancing girls, and he tells stories of, you know, the great Persian conqueror, and the great stories of the Romans and the Greeks. So young Muslims go into the house of Arkham to listen to the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, would say, yeah, let's just stop here for a minute. We'll go there eventually. We'll sit here, relax, listen to some stories, see some dancing girls, hear them sing a little bit. Eh, it's okay. I'll make toba later. They sit down. An hour goes by. Two hours go by. Three hours go by. Four hours go by. Nine hours go by. You know, the average American spends, the average American youth, which includes our youth, obviously, spends nine hours a day on media. Whether it's television or computer or games, nine hours a day. That's a full-time job. So we're very distracted. So we have to learn how to be disciplined enough to walk by these distractions and go to the Prophet ﷺ and take the guidance from him. Inshallah ta'ala, aqulu qawli hadha wa astaghfirullah li wa lakum fa astaghfiru innahu wa lakum fa astaghfiru.